Hi, I'm Paul May with Equipped Expedition Outfitters. I've spent a, a great deal of my life uh, exploring this planet in many ways and ways and forms. The last 15 years or so, I uh, developed a company to help other people uh, travel the, the adventure lifestyle like I have, and it's been a wonderful ride. One of my great pleasures has been to represent a company called National Luna. They build some of the best vehicle-based electrical systems, in my opinion, on the planet. And uh, in that position, we answer a lot of questions for folks about electrical systems, uh, the broad range of questions. And so what I thought I would do here is spend a little bit of time, share a little bit of my experience uh, with you uh, regarding the elect basic Overland vehicle electrical systems. Just take a uh, broad overview of what things are involved in that system, take a more holistic approach to tackling that box of smoke, uh, and see if I can't give some insight that might help you uh, with your adventures going down the road. So some of the things that I want to talk about are the, the goals that you have. What do you want to do? Uh, vehicles. What's your preference in vehicle? If you're going to take a vehicle as, as your mode of transportation. We're going to talk about what options are out there for you regarding um, electrical systems. Uh, what systems might work best in, in the vehicle that you have. We'll talk about battery systems. We're going to talk about uh, charging systems alternate charging systems, and also uh, distribution of electrical within the vehicle. So let's take each one of those topics at a time and see what we can come up with. So I think the first thing that we ought to do is talk about goals. And that's gonna be a very personal question that you're gonna to need to, to search yourself for. What is your goal here? Is your goal to travel the planet? Is your goal to go out for a weekend with the kids? Is your goal to live on the road in your vehicle full time? What is your plan? How do you want to make this system work for you? The vehicle and the goal is really gonna be the footprint of where you start with any of these processes. And each one of those, those choices are all perfectly fine choices but it's a matter of what you want the end result to be and how you get there and what is necessary to get you to that op that that goal. Uh, our goal here is not to sell you a whole bunch of stuff, whether it's me or any of the companies out there, to sell you a bunch of stuff that you're just nece not necessarily going to need. That doesn't do any good whatsoever. It's better for you to, to get what you need up front and spend the rest of the money on gas and get to where you wanna go. So think about what are your goals? Am I going to be going by motorcycle? Am I gonna be bike packing? Am I going to be river rafting? Am I going to be doing all of the above? It really depends on what your plan is. Once you know what your goal is, then we can start talking about how to reach those goals through a set of steps. Now that we touched on goals, I'm pretty sure that most of the folks that if you are watching this have a pretty darn good idea of what your goal is, uh, whatever that plan might be. Uh, and the next topic that we're gonna talk about here is vehicles. And I bet you have a pretty good idea about what vehicle you want, but I wanna throw out just a few things to think about and, and make sure that what you think is the vehicle choice for you is the right vehicle choice for your activity. Uh, one thing that we, we first ask people when they come in and ask, where do we start? How do I do this? The number one question, uh, if you're going to take a vehicle and plan on living out of it, which is what world we're in here, are you going to be living inside the vehicle or are you going to be living outside the vehicle? It's a very important choice to be making right up front. Uh, what I mean by that is if you're going to be somebody that's going to take an SUV, uh, a Land Cruiser, a Land Rover, a Jeep, whatever it might be of your choice, uh, your color, whatever. That vehicle is not gonna have enough space on the interior of that vehicle for you to live very functionally versus going with something like a Sprinter van. Now a Sprinter van, there's room that you can actually live on the inside of that vehicle. You're cooking, you're sleeping, your, your daily life activities can be in there, whether it's a, a Sprinter van, 
or a camper or a flatbed uh, camping solution, are you gonna be inside or outside that vehicle? And at that choice point, you start to decide a little bit about what functionality you need your electrical system uh, to work for you. Uh, how many or how much battery um, do you need for the activities you're doing? Do you need to have a battery system in the vehicle? Uh, what are the things you're gonna start connecting to it? All of those things come into play. So vehicle choice really does uh, start the whole process of your design tree from goal to vehicle to how do we put all this together. And now we'll, we'll uh, talk about some of these other steps uh, going down the way. But first of all, decide what vehicle you're gonna be working on here and let's make a plan from there. Okay, so now we've gone through some, some different steps here. So we've decided uh, what our goals are and what vehicle we're going to be using in those goals. And now we need to start talking about options. Uh, and what I'm talking about options here is that there is a wide range of electrical opportunities for a vehicle. And that vehicle can run anywhere from a Volkswagen station wagon up to full size, you know, one ton trucks. And it depends on what you plan on doing. If you're more of the weekender, you're gonna go out for a night, maybe two, the electrical system you need for that is going to be a lot different than somebody that say is going to either be going full time or going to be traveling the world or going extreme on their travel and their adventure uh, travels, whether it's domestic or international. Uh, and the intensity of the electrical requirements. Now let's talk about that for a second. What I'm talking about there is uh, there are some electrical systems out there that you can take a battery. Let's say your goal is I want to have a fridge in my vehicle. Uh, I plan on going out for a couple days over a weekend and that's all I really need it to do. And I'm really not that interested in modifying my vehicle to a level necessary to, uh, to change its current function. There are some options out there that would allow you to take a fridge, charge it from, and run that fridge from a battery that you charge at home, or you take and charge from an alternate uh, charging system like solar, and you wouldn't have to alter your vehicle whatsoever. It's a matter of plugging it at home, charging it up, getting that electrical charged source ready for you, and taking it with you with a fridge of whatever size of nature you have. Perfectly fine, that's, that's an absolute option. Uh, there are options, and I've, I've got a few here, that will allow you to do exactly that, and that's great. That way, you're not modifying your vehicle at all. The cost in relative terms is quite low, and it's possible to do with just purchasing some basic items. Awesome. Now, on the other side of things is where we spend most of our time, and that is in situations where folks are interested in building out a vehicle, in permanently installing uh, electrical systems that can be charged by vehicle as well as alternate charging uh, solutions using batteries of various types to uh, create the optimal solution for them. There are power requirement differences between vehicles, electrical system connections that uh, take on some, some different functions. And that's where uh, equipped and I spend a lot of time in is talking about those electrical systems that are a little bit more advanced than simply going out for the weekend. Uh, and I think that's where we ought to go next with our discussion. Okay, now we've got the we've got our goals figured out. We have our vehicle choice. Uh, we have uh, decided that we want to put something a little bit more robust in our vehicle as far as an electrical system. Now what, right? Uh, the next question to me that comes up for discussion is, okay, where are you going to put this electrical system? And there's uh, a couple different options. Uh, it comes down to two, quite honestly. You come up with either an electrical system where you can charge a battery under the hood or not under the hood, which usually means either in a pickup bed or the back of an SUV or somewhere on the interior of a van and some occasions actually mounting the batteries under the vehicle in enclosed uh, cases. All of those are great options. 
And it's a matter of a decision set amongst those one inside or outside. Usually it's an easy choice. If you look under the hood and there is absolutely no room to put a battery, then, well, then it makes sense that we have to put that battery elsewhere. Uh, on the off occasion that you have room to put a, a, a battery under the hood with slight modifications, I personally think that's a great alternative to putting it in the back of the vehicle. And the reason why is that in most of the vehicles that folks are running out there, whether it be a pickup truck or an SUV, uh, just shy of a, of, of a van or something like that, uh, interior space is premium. That space is gold. And so using that space up to put a battery system in is, uh, it takes away from that space being used for alternate possibilities, whatever that might be. And if there is space under the hood that is not being utilized, awesome. That's a great place to put it. A couple of good reasons for that. One is it shortens the length of the wire necessary for the electrical system. Current drops in its strength over, uh, uh, over a, a length of wire. Uh, in the terms we're talking, not a whole lot, but if you can keep the battery that you're charging, your alternate battery system, close to your main battery, the better off that battery is going to be charging. Is it a game changer if you decide to put it in the back of the vehicle? No, not at all, not, not gonna change a whole lot. But the closer you can keep those two batteries together in the electrical connection, uh, the shorter the distance of the wire, the less voltage drop there is, the better the charging capacity is going to be, if you have room. Okay, so now let's say you looked under the hood and well, dang, there's no room under there, I'm not gonna be able to do that. There are solutions to put batteries in the back of it, and I'm, I'm sitting right in front of a couple of the opportunities here, uh, to relocate that battery system to inside the vehicle or in the truck bed or where it might be, where you would have that management system and the battery stored somewhere within that space. And that's quite possible to do too. A third alternative is to do something that what I would call a hybrid, where you have the management system of of the charging system for that auxiliary battery mounted under the hood with your, your main battery and the alternator and engine and all that. And the battery is located in an alternate location. That is a possibility too, depending on what your, your specific situation is and what your design parameters are and what you want from that auxiliary battery. So there's, there's a, a choice to be made, uh, a, a system of decisions that you need to think over uh, significantly here, because this is going to be the, the basis of where you're going to run all of your electrical system from. Are you looking at things like uh, uh, lighting? Are you gonna do a pile of lighting on your, uh, on your vehicle? Or is it a matter of just simply plugging in a fridge and having a couple other electrical, electrical accessories plugged in once you're, once you're somewhere? Decisions like that are going to also affect uh, your decisions. Uh, installation and the cost of that, whether it's your time or your money to install that process in your vehicle is also something to be uh, considered. Uh, so that's, that's where I would start. Decide where that electrical system makes sense and we've got a lot of op options and stuff that we can, we can talk through with you if you'd like. But from there, the other decisions in your electrical systems are going to be based. So think that one through a little bit. Let's go on to the next topic. Okay, so our next uh, topic here, there's actually two topics and they're kind of intertwined. Um, and so we've got to tackle both of them independently, but we're going to get down in, into the weeds here a little bit. The, the next two topics are type of batteries and type of charging systems. And they're intertwined. First, we're gonna talk about batteries. And that's, um, I think, one of the most confusing thing that, things that uh, folks talk to us about is, what type of battery am I talking about here? How big a battery do I need? Is it, does it need to be this style or that style? Or what if I get into these different scenarios? And it can be really confusing and there's not a lot of clear information out there. And, and I don't, speak to be the, the all-knowing voice here, but I can tell you what my experience is uh, with the different battery systems or battery styles that are out there and the, ba uh, the battery 
charging systems that are out there. And uh, it comes down to me to a couple things. One is cost and the other is performance. And they're at um, opposing angles on a graph, if you will. Um, the three main battery types out there that, that we know or hear of are uh, lead acid batteries, uh, what they call an AGM or uh, an absorbed glass mat, a deep cycle marine style battery. And then the relatively new kit on the block is the lithium ion or LIFO style batteries. Let's talk about each one of those for a second. So a lead acid battery is a battery that is most commonly under the hood for your vehicle to use to start your vehicle. It has the goal of making sure that it's charged up high enough that when you turn the ignition on your vehicle, the car starts, okay? And that's its goal. There are electrical systems on the vehicles and the vehicles are getting smarter about their electrical systems and charging, uh, but it's pretty much a constant right now that the lead acid battery is your starting battery. Why? Well, one big thing is that it, uh, cost-wise, it's, it's the least, as if, least expensive, most effective battery for doing the job that it does, which is starting your car. When you're looking at batteries, there are two main numbers that you're going to hear all the time. One is called cold cranking amps, a CCA, or amp hours. And amp hours can either be uh, under amp hours or it could also be called reserve capacity. And what the difference is, is a cold cranking amp uh, rating, the higher that rating is, the more uh, available current is, uh, can be used to start your vehicle from a, uh, from a cold engine uh, perspective. Um, Petroleum-based vehicles, gas vehicles, take less cold cranking amps than say a diesel. And so you'll find in a lot of the diesel trucks out there with the big engines in them, they actually have two batteries under there. And the reason why is because they need to combine the cold cranking amps of two batteries to turn over those big uh, engines to get them running and, and up to pace. Um, so the, what you'll find in the lead acid batteries is they don't have a really a high amp hour capacity. Um, their, their job is to start the vehicle and then be slowly charged by the alternator when the vehicle is running. They do an awesome job at that aspect. One of the things that we do when we're out doing our overlanding experience is that we have um, electrical draws on the vehicle when the vehicle is stopped. Um, the largest draw on most any vehicle setup that I've seen out there is a refrigerator. The fridges take a, a considerable amount of power. And that power is used over a long period of time. Uh, overnight, could be days. And drawing down a battery, like a lead acid battery, like that, you draw it down to a certain, uh, certain level and you can't charge it back. It's not recoverable. It will hurt that battery. It harms it. And so out of the battery options, lead acid battery is probably the worst of the three. It's most cost effective, but it has its job. And its job is not to run electrical systems on a vehicle for a period of time. That's not what it's designed to do. So I kind of push that one aside and say, okay, let it do its job. It's a great battery for starting the vehicle. Awesome, let's leave it there. The next style of battery, and it's the most common style of battery, is one that's called an AGM, which stands for Absorbed Glass Mat, which is a type of internal design uh, that uh, the battery has. You're also gonna hear words like uh, deep cycle or marine uh, batteries, and sometimes they're all used together. AGM, deep cycle marine battery, awesome. That's a really good battery. And what's nice about the uh, AGM batteries is that they are specifically designed for a relative, uh, relatively rapid uh, charging rate. So you can charge them back up relatively quickly. Uh, but also you can drain that battery over a long period of time with, with a long, slow drain. 
up to a certain level of, of the battery's capacity and then charge it back up rather quickly and not have any damage to that battery. It's designed for that fluctuation of uh, relatively rapid charging and long drawn out uh, use. Okay, so you can, you can use it in, in all sorts of aspects of the vehicle. Um, so that battery in our market right now is the most common battery. It is kind of the middle ground as far as cost and performance. Uh, and, does it, and they do a great job. The uh, size of an AGM battery runs the gambit. It is available in a whale of a lot of sizes and voltages. You can get them in six volt, which honestly most golf carts are run on six volt batteries, AGMs, uh, or 12 volt. And you can get them anywhere from sizes, you know, four to six inches up to monstrous batteries if you want to. Um, most of the things that we deal with, we try to use uh, a battery size, it's called a Group 31. And a Group 31 will fit in a box like I've got here, one of these guys here. Or you can get them to fit under the hood as well. We've got a uh, Land Cruiser with one under the hood. What that battery does for you is it provides you with anywhere in the range of between 100 and 120 amp hours of, of uh, capacity. Uh, so it has a, uh, in, in terms of our, our usage, a pretty high capacity or reserve capacity. And so that makes it so that I can run a fridge on a, a typical spring day for a couple days without any recharge requirement at all. Uh, and that's pretty optimal for a weekend activity. Or if you're traveling and you're driving every day, charging becomes no, no issue at all. It just simply does the job for you day in and day out. So uh, the absorbed glass mat batteries are right now the pretty the most common way of going about it. Uh, the third option that's becoming more and more uh, popular is the lithium ion or LIFO, uh, lithium phosphate. Those batteries are pretty darn intriguing. And the reason why they're so interesting to look at is they have some some great uh, some great uh, I would say pros and a couple cons that we need to talk about. Um, the lithium ion batteries are similar, just larger versions of what you have in your phone, in your watch, in your camera, in uh, different activities like that, uh, and they they have some some great capability. One of their wonderful capabilities is as opposed to like a, a lead acid or an AGM battery that is you use the battery the battery's capacity slowly diminishes over time okay the lithium batteries run at full capacity until it turns off you've seen your phone it'll run at every function you want it until it won't and then it turns itself off and uh, that's how a lithium ion or lithium phosphate battery runs it runs at full charge Gives you everything it's got until it's done. Okay, well that's that's really cool. The other thing that I really like about lithium ions is their weight. They don't weigh much in relative terms to a lead acid battery or an AGM battery. They don't weigh much at all. Uh, they're at half, if not less than half, the weight of an AGM battery. And if you're watching weight in your vehicle, I mean like seriously watching your weight in the vehicle, that can be something that you want to take. Uh, full advantage of uh, is something like that. Uh, so there's some really good uh, pros to that side. A couple of the cons to a lithium ion battery. One is that they don't care for temperature too much. Too high a temperature, they won't charge or discharge. Too low a temperature, they won't charge or discharge. Uh, most of the lithium ion batteries, if you get them down below 30 deg 32 degrees Fahrenheit, they start to, to really kind of not work well. Uh, they won't discharge and they won't charge very well. Um, so that's that's something that you really need, need to watch out on that. Uh, the other thing that you have to take in mind is that when you have a lithium ion battery and it has power until it doesn't, there's a battery management system in a lithium ion battery that turns itself off to zero. Well, in the second portion of what we're gonna talk about here, we start talking about charging systems. And one of the things that the charging systems require is the ability 
to know that two batteries are connected to it to charge together. And um, if the lithium ion battery turns itself off, the battery charging system can't see it unless it's set up correctly. It can't see it because its voltage is, is turned off. So that becomes an obstacle as well. With each obstacle, there are ways to go around that obstacle or find a solution to that obstacle. Temperature. There are batteries on the market now that are mitigating the cold temperature concerns with heating themselves in, in some instances or finding other ways of, of um, changing that. Charging systems are finding ways to hook to lithium batteries and know that they are a lithium battery uh, and then can, can adjust to manage that charge. The biggest con that I know of right now uh, to a lithium ion battery is cost. Where a lead acid battery might run you 120, 150 bucks. An AGM battery and worth its salt is gonna run you anywhere from 250 to 300 plus dollars. Um, lithium ion can run you anywhere from 800 to 1200 dollars and up. Um, they have longer life, uh, lifetime, lifespan, more cycles in their charge discharge, which is great, which helps offset the price uh, some if you look at it as a long-term thing. But they are still expensive. Um, one of the analogies that I tell a lot of people, and this will change over time, so we'll see how long this video is, uh, is current, but if you think of it in relative terms to what um, the big LCD televisions were five years ago compared to what they are now, a large screen LCD TV was running you in the thousands of dollars. Now it's running you in the hundreds of dollars. And I, I think like anything in our world, technology eventually catches up with the economic reality of, of people's abilities. And I see the cost of lithium coming down uh, as more of it gets used and it becomes more commonplace like any of the other electrical and electronic uses in the market. So I'm, I'm personally, I'm still an AGM guy, uh, but slowly turning over to the lithium guy. Uh, and I, I see its potential, I see its future and its prospect. And I, I know that that's, that's where most of us are gonna end up going is lithium. It's coming, uh, it's expensive for the guys that can play in that world, awesome. Uh, but for right now, if, if you can't get up into that, that money space, then this is a good alternative is to go with something like an AGM battery for now. Buy an AGM, by the time it's dead, the lithiums will be at a good price point and you can move on for there. If you can afford lithium, go at it. It's a good option. Okay, so now, uh, now that we've talked about batteries, we're gonna go for a little bit further into the weeds here and get down to the ground level and start talking about um, how do we charge these batteries correctly in our vehicle uh, to make sure that we don't have any problems down the road with what we're doing here. And uh, what our charging system capabilities are is gonna be based off of the decision on what type of battery that you wanna to choose to, to use in your vehicle. Um, whether it's lead acid, which I, I don't think is a good idea, an AGM battery, which has its own charging requirements, and lithium ion, which has its own charging requirements too, to work in an automotive application. So let's, let's talk about uh, our alternatives for battery charging. Well, the first and most simple option is to add a vehicle, or uh, excuse me, add a battery in your vehicle somewhere and run two wires to it and connect it to the main battery in parallel and let both of those batteries charge together. It's a very, very simple, uncomplicated process. Two wires connected up, two batteries connected up, simple, relatively cheap. Problem with that is, is that, that now you've connected your main battery to your auxiliary battery. And if you take a fridge and you plug it into that auxiliary battery, you are in essence lowering the voltage of both batteries in your vehicle. And if you lower both batteries in your vehicle low enough, your car's not gonna start, okay? Rule number one, rule number one in this whole thing is get home. 
okay? And if you can't start your vehicle, then that's not going to work out very well for you. So a simple direct wire connection is not something that I would suggest you do. So now what we want to make sure is that you can be able to disconnect the auxiliary battery, which you're discharging with all your toys, from your main battery. You want to leave the main battery alone and let it do its job, and that's what it is. All right, different ways of doing that. It can be as simple as adding a disconnect switch in those two wires that you're running from one battery to the other. That's absolutely possible to do. Uh, a simple twitch, uh, switch, turn on, turn off. Um, you connect it while you're driving. Disconnect it when you get where you're going and you've solved your battery management system. Very inexpensive way of going about it. Not too bad at all. Uh, you could do something like that. Um, what happens there is then you're always wondering, okay, did I turn it on? Did I turn it off? Am I connected long enough for the battery to charge? Is, is, it, is it doing its job? Is the battery charged up? There's a whole other process. You have now become a slave to your process in your vehicle. Uh, and that's not always fun to, to try to figure out. Is it possible? Yes. Is it an inexpensive way of going about it? Absolutely. Definitely a possibility. But there are other alternatives out there and a lot of them that are doing quite a good job and, and National Luna is one of them. And shameless plug there. But um, what National Luna does is in essence the same thing. They connect two batteries together and they've automated the system and, it, and it's based off of the circuitry within uh, the battery management system. And it, it's not just National Luna, there are other brands out there that do this. And what, they, what you do is you hook up the wires uh, from one battery to the other through a battery management system. And it's an automated system where the system watches the voltage available to it and connects and isolates that auxiliary battery based off of the voltage available. And it's typically a voltage high enough that's coming off of your alternator to your main battery to signal to the system to close the contact and connect the two batteries together. It's in essence a switch, okay? But it's automated. And what's nice about that is now you don't have to worry about that. The system will take care of itself. It'll connect when the vehicle's uh, available current is high enough to charge the battery. It'll isolate itself when the avail available current drops down below a certain level. And it just does that. And it takes that out of your mind as far as, as your necessity to continually contact and, and disconnect that auxiliary battery. So that's the system I've been using for the last 15 years uh, in my vehicles, and it's worked quite well. So uh, if that's possible, awesome, that sounds like a really good solution, but there's a trick to that, okay? And it comes down to battery choices. And uh, not only battery choices, but vehicle output uh, with regard to the alternator. National Luna has spent years and years looking at um, battery possibilities. They filled a room full of computers and really smart guys, and they spent a long time trying every battery you can imagine, from the lowest to the highest, everything in between, in charging and discharging and temperature and charge rates and about 50 other things that I can't tell you right now. And they put it all into, uh, into their calculations some of the technology wasn't even available to uh, to try these things on batteries. Battery companies were not generous with the information about it. So National Luna spent a lot of time figuring out what's best. And these Mensa level guys over there, they came up with a chart that really does distill down what's possible. And I'm gonna, I'll show the chart on our video here so that you can get an idea. And I'm gonna start waving my hands around, so forgive me here. And what they figured out is that they, they looked at charging batteries uh, and what's necessary to charge a battery. So let's talk about an AGM battery for a minute. An AGM battery has some great qualities about it. Rapid charging, long-term uh, uh, discharging capability, uh, and its charge rate uh, is not bad, but it has certain requirements. AGMs like to have a voltage optimally 
up in the mid 14 volt range for maximum optimum charge to finally get to that top charge. Is it necessary to have that voltage? No. Is it nice? Yeah, it's really nice to have that. Um, but what's, what's possible out of our vehicles, like most of our vehicles that we're running around with now have alternators that are putting out anywhere from 100 to 165, 170 amps of power. But more important than amperage is voltage in charging an AGM battery. Um, the voltage it needs needs to be up in that mid-14 range. AGM batteries can only absorb between 20 and 25 amps. So my analogy for an alternator on uh, an AGM battery is like trying to fill a bottle with a fire hose. The bottle's going to decide how fast it fills up and when it's full, right? You've got amperage that's overkill for a battery charge. But what is also necessary, more important, is the voltage that is, is drawn to that battery. You've got plenty of amperage, but you need to have the voltage on an arc that gives it enough current to charge that battery up. What National Luna found is that if you can get uh, an alternator in your vehicle to put out a consistent voltage of 13.9 volts or higher, you're going to be able to charge your AGM batteries up to within a few percentile of complete, okay? Um, it, it's not necessary for your vehicle to top off every time it charges a battery, but what it needs to do is maintain that battery over a long period of time for you to take your travels. So if we can get up to 95-ish, 98% of a total charge over a, a long period of time, wonderful, okay? And um, so there are different uh, charging systems available there. There's two charging systems out on the market in general terms. One is um, a charging system, which is called a battery management system. It's a simple uh, connection from uh, your main battery to an auxiliary battery. The current from your alternator provides the amperage and voltage to that system and it charges. The other one that's become more prevalent in the market now is a system called a DC to DC charging system. Now what a DC DC charging system does is it takes an alternator's current from off of your bat main battery with a high amperage and an okay voltage, puts it into this box of smoke, swirls it around mathematically and pops out 20 to 25 amps or 40 amps in certain in circumstances at a constant 14.4 volts. Okay, perfect. It is providing the amperage and the voltage necessary for charging a battery. Wonderful. But what we're running into, into the, all this analogy and me flailing my hands around here, is so what happens is if, if you take my hands and you have a percent of, percent of charge on this axis and um, time on this axis, you take a, uh, an AGM battery that's been depleted down 70% out of its capacity and you start charging it. If we look at the, at the charts, here's, you know, we've got time or we've got time and charge. You notice that if your vehicle puts out 13.9 or better, the charge rate is rather vertical to start with and then starts to taper off the more you get out here as far as uh, um, total charge. And so you're, you're getting a lot of charge in the first two to three hours, and then it tapers off. Okay, that's from the alternator. The DC to DC systems, what happens on those is because it's a constant low amperage, the line is, quite honestly, it's about a 45 degree angle. It, it goes out here, but will go higher in charge than the alternator system over a longer period of time, but we're talking anywhere five, six, seven, eight hours in that scale uh, for that charging to happen. So if you're, tr if you're traveling only a couple hours at a day or at a time, your charging rate is actually faster with the standard battery management system than it is with the DC to DC charge system. Um, so that's, that's something to keep in mind when you're making these decisions. Uh, is DC the DC the be-all end-all? 
Maybe not. Uh, if you're going with the, with the AGM style battery specifically, okay? Uh, if, if money is a concern, the battery management systems are about half the price of the DC, the DC charging systems. Um, if you typically spend six, seven, eight hours a day driving, DC to DC might gain you a couple percentile out on the far end of that. Now, what if your vehicle doesn't put out 13.9? It just doesn't simply, doesn't get there. What you find if, you're, if your alternator is putting out 13.5, 13.6, 13.7, you're only gonna be able to charge that battery on a normal battery management system up to around 85%-ish of total charge of that battery. And we'll have, we have a graph, we can show you that, that range too. But what it means is that it, if your vehicle's current is above 13.9, cost effectively and time for charge on, a, on an ongoing basis, DC to DC is overkill for what you're doing. If you're under that 13.9 volts, DC to DC becomes a lot more uh, of a solution for you, uh, for your battery charging. There's some other circumstances I want to talk to in a little bit I mean, under alternate charging about what the normal battery management system can do and can't do versus the DC to DC charging systems. So that's a talk about a battery system for an AGM. Now let's talk about um, a DC to DC charge system and lithium ion or LIFO. It's possible to charge a lithium ion battery with your alternator, but it's not good for it. It's really hard to do that. Um, lithium has its own concerns and, and requirements for charging. DC to DC charging systems are designed with the ability to charge lithium ion and LIFO batteries in their electronic makeup. That's what they do. And that's what we have here is some DC to DC charging systems. The nice thing about a, uh, a lithium ion battery is that it high, has a higher amperage um, absorption rate, okay? Instead of being limited at that 20 to 25 amp uh, requirement, it can go up higher to that. Uh, we have a system that goes up to 40 amps. If you hook a lithium ion battery up to um, a DC to DC system on a 40 amp charge, you can get a dang close to full rapid charge out of that in under two hours, to complete charge. Doesn't mean that the 25 amp version or uh, the DC 25 amp can't do that. It'll take a little over two hours. It might take less than three hours versus less than two hours for the 40 amp. Uh, so either one is possible. It's a matter of money, matter of space choices. Um, but it, it does really do a good job for those lithium batteries to get them to a, a, a higher charge rate. Uh, so how do we distill this down? Charging. One, check your vehicle. What is its output? Okay. Is it above 13.9, below 13.9? Okay. Make those decisions. Can I afford an AGM or can I afford lithium? Okay. If it's an AGM system, I would say uh, if it's below 13.9 and it's an AGM system you want to go to, I would go with the DC25, a 25 amp output um, a system. If you're going, map, sky's the limit, no problem, I'm going to go lithium, I want to do this, I would go with the DC40 uh, uh, amp system as a solution because you're going to get maximum charge out of that. And especially in bigger vehicles, if you have multiple batteries you're trying to charge, it's going to be able to charge all of those batteries up faster, uh, which means that you know, your, your trip time can be between state parks in a couple hours here in Utah, that's all it takes. A couple hour drive and you're back up to full charge. Awesome, that's the way to go. So there are different charging, charging possibilities here. DC management, uh, direct switch, um, the battery management system in between the DC to DC. And then the other one is, okay, so now location comes back into play. Where do you want to put it? 
We have a couple systems here that are interesting to, to take a look at. We have a battery management system that is designed to be under the hood. We have it uh, in a hybrid where you mount the management system under the hood and you can run into a distribution box in the back that holds the battery for you. So it keeps the battery in the back. We have distribution systems built into boxes uh, for battery management. We have DC to DC systems built in a portable box. So decisions to be made there. Another alternative is what if you have more than one vehicle? The portable systems that we have here, you could run the electrical to the locations, whether it's in the back of your SUV for the dailies and your Sprinter van for your week trips, you take that system and move it between the vehicles. Instead of having to have two different battery management systems, one for the SUV, one for the van, you can use this system in both of them. So it's, it's a decision set that also needs to be made. So I hope that helped out some. Um, let's, uh, let's use that information and go on to a couple other topics. All right, so now we've talked about all sorts of things here so far. We talked about what your goals are. We've chosen a vehicle for our goals. We've come up with the options that, yeah, maybe I need a more robust electrical system in my vehicle. Okay, where am I gonna put it? Uh, the type of battery that I think is gonna be best for my circumstances is this. Uh, we've decided on a charging system that can be put in the, in the vehicle or behind the vehicle or part of the vehicle. Awesome, okay, what, what else do we need to talk about here? Well, the other thing that is, is something that we should chat about also dis uh, involves your options as far as charging. Back when we talked about options, whether you needed a little system or, or other system. Uh, and what that, what that means is that I want to talk to you a minute and I move some stuff out of the way to show you a couple, a couple things. The two most common ways of uh, alternative charging for your system, whether, you know, when your vehicle is not running and not using the vehicle as a generator of electrical current, would be 120 volt charging uh, or a shore power connection, I guess is uh, for, for the term, or um, solar power as an opportunity for charging your system. And how, how do those two things work into your, into your process? The two batteries that we've come down to that are most commonly used are the AGM batteries and the lithium. And we talked about those in process. And we also talked about the, the vehicle's ability to charge those and charge rates and some other things there. Um, but what, what I wanna to talk to you first about is 120 volt charging. Remember when I was talking to you about um, the charge of your battery and the battery management system getting up to 95% or if not, 85% somewhere in there in a, in a charge rate curve. Uh, AGM batteries in particular want to have what they call a boost charge or an optimal maximum charge capacity in there. Your alternator is just not gonna get there. It just simply isn't gonna get up to the level that will boost and bump charge the, the top, uh, top algorithms there. And um, that's where 120 volt charging comes into play. Um, for years and years and years, I didn't do anything with 120 volt charging. I, I accepted the fact that my truck was not putting out the current. It was necessary to top off the batteries. What's the drawback of never doing 120 volt charging on an, on an AGM to, to top that off? Well, what you end up doing is shortening the life of the battery um, significantly, 10%, sometimes 15%. And you're also uh, reducing over time the cap that that battery can charge up to. So you're not getting up to your 100 to 120 amp hours of power. You're now getting 90 and 80 percent of that of that total. So every once in a while, whether it's once a month or once a quarter or sometimes, it's always a good idea to throw your vehicle on a 120 volt charger. Uh, National Luna makes a um, a battery charger but only in 220 volts, uh, which is awesome for the rest of the planet, not so awesome for the United States. So uh, we use a one, uh, 110 volt charger. We're pretty fond of the, of the NOCO chargers. I think they do a fantastic job. And what, what they do is they have built-in algorithms 
that will uh, diagnose the battery, what rate of, rate of charge it has, and run it through a set of charge functionality to boost and top charge that battery up to optimal charge capacity. Uh, and then you're ready to go again. Uh, it's something that you can do every once in a while. It, it could be over a weekend uh, or a weekday that you're not running the vehicle. Plug it in overnight. The charger will do its job. Optimize your battery as best possible. And if you do that, oh, God, it's half a dozen times a year, somewhere in that range, it's going to help uh, strengthen your battery, give you more capacity and longevity of your battery uh, as well. Very good option to do that. Now, what they have on, on these are a couple different connections. Uh, you can go with alligator clips right to the right to the battery, uh, or you can uh, hardwire a plug to the battery, and they have, have their positions here too. The National Luna systems have what they call an NL5 charger connection, which is that 220 volt rest of the planet connection. But we have the pigtail for that. And with a couple wire splices, you could go straight to a NOCO charger and plug that thing right in, bang. And that, that works out great for the pop, for those. You can get NOCOs in, a, in any of the battery chargers. There's, a good, uh, there's some that are just as good and, and equal. But um, you can go anything from a, a one amp charger to a two and a half, to a five, to a 10, to a 13, to 26 volt or amps. Why, what? It's all a matter of rate of charge. Uh, on the different sizes. If it's something that's just using from home, economically, a five or a 10 amp charger is gonna be plenty for you because if you plug overnight, you're gonna have the time to take care of it. It's not, not too big of a deal. Are you gaining anything more charging faster? Not really. Um, both will do the job and take care of an AGM that we're using in our vehicles. So you can choose to go larger. Awesome, if you can, great. There's no downside to that, but if, if not, you can get something under a hundred bucks. It's going to take care of the situation on a 120 charge. And it's not only for that, but if you're, if you're not going out with your DC to DC charging and you're not going out for an eight hour drive all the time, uh, then you're going to need to, to supplement the charge even with the DC to DC. And this is a good way to go about it. Okay. Well, that's great. As long as you're at home, all right? So what if you're not, um, Let's talk about solar as an opportunity for you. What I've found in my experiences, uh, is I, I carry a solar panel with me all the time. What I found is I use it a couple times a year. And the reason why is because I'm terrible at sitting still. I like to drive, I like to go see things and I want to be on the move. And if I'm on the move, my vehicle's charging the system. And I have found that I haven't had a whole lot of downtime as far as running out of power uh, for my refrigerator, for my electronics demands, radios, lights, whatever. So uh, it, it sits in my vehicle for ready to use, but I, I end up not using it a whole lot. Um, but when I do, uh, what I have found is that the fridges that we have on the market, and I, I'm, I'm pretty partial to the National Luna fridges, because they use so little energy, is that a fridge in your in your vehicle on an average typical 70 degree day, running it as a refrigerator only, um, you're going to be able to offset the draw of that fridge on a daily basis with a, a really good panel somewhere in the range uh, between 80 and 100 watts of solar power. It's a thumbnail. It's not like, well, Paul said I only needed blah. No, it's a thumbnail idea. Uh, it depends on the panel that you're using, the solar controller you're using, and a lot of other aspects there. If you can get up in the mid 100 range, 130 or better, you're going to make sure that you're going to be okay running a fridge. It also depends on the size of the fridge and the temperatures and a, and a whole other, that's a whole other conversation. But what I run around with is uh, one of the Overland Solar Bug Out 130 watt panels. Never had an issue. I lay it out on the on the windshield. I can camp for days, park on a beach in Baja, throw that on the windshield and forget it and just do its thing. Not a problem at all. Let's talk about solar for a minute so that everybody's on the same page about solar. So what a solar panel is. Here's, I'll, I'll show you. This is the 
foldable panel that I have. It's a 130 watt panel, folds up, I put it in the storage box in my vehicle to be used if necessary, okay? Now what a solar panel does is it creates energy based off of sun absorption and it puts it through a wire uh, and it, it depends on the, the intensity of the sun uh, and, and what you're getting out of that angle of the sun with, with your panel. But these little guys will put out a voltage somewhere in the high 30 volt range with four to five amps, I mean, if, if, at max capacity. If you were to take that panel and hook it directly to your 12 volt battery, it would fry it, it would kill it. Uh, it's too much, it's not designed, the battery's not designed to charge with that much power pushed to that battery. And so what they do to control that power is they put an inline uh, solar controller, okay? Now what this guy does here is it has an input from your solar panel. It takes it in here and like that, that other box of smoke, it's all mathematics here. It takes in that higher voltage at a lower amperage, swirls it around and pops it out on the other side of that cable at a, po a proper charging voltage, somewhere in the 13 to 14 volt range for your, for your battery at a higher amperage rate, okay? So this is a very, very, very important piece of equipment to have in between your solar panel and your battery system. You can set this up either hardwired in your vehicle, you can set it up to be portable like I do because I run this power or the solar panel between uh, pick up with a camper, pick up with a shell, a trailer, an SUV, uh, multiple vehicles. I can use the same solar panel on all of them. So it's not a hard mount system. If you want to do a full time hard mount system, that's awesome. But this is the way that I go. Now, what's nice about um, if you go the DC to DC charge rate uh, system, most of the DC to DC systems out there have incorporated a solar controller in them. Like the National Luna systems, both the, the, the hard mount and the portable systems have a um, MPPT solar controller built into them. The 25 amp system has up to 375 watts of input capacity. The 40 amp system can go up to 600 watts of input capacity. Okay, so how much solar do we need? Well, what are you running? Okay, so what are your demands? Let's back into this. How much demand are you gonna need to run what you have in your vehicle? For me, 130 watts is plenty. But if you're running a bigger vehicle, say you're running a Sprinter van and you've got all sorts of other things going on in that vehicle, big fridges, maybe two fridges, you're running your espresso machines or whatever you have in there, you might need to put more solar on that vehicle. And to run it, you need to make sure that you have a solar controller that can manage that power to put it into your battery system. I hope that helped. Give you a couple alternatives to your vehicle being your charging system. And these are robust systems. These are not your uh, charge your laptop uh, with the panel on your backpack kind of stuff. We're talking the, the larger level of solar and uh, 110 charging systems for vehicle based. I hope that helped. Okay, so now we've talked about all sorts of things here. We've got the vehicles involved, we've got battery systems been figured out, we've got charging figures out, we have alternative charging systems figured out. One thing that we haven't talked about a whole lot, a little bit here and there, is the distribution of panel, or of, excuse me, the distribution of power in your vehicle. So let's take an example. I have a Land Cruiser, 200 series Land Cruiser. I have mounted the bat auxiliary battery under the hood for, um, for auxiliary power. Now what? Um, what we want to talk about is distribution of power. How do you get that power around to where you need it? Now comes another set of questions, okay? The questions being, what do I need to run in my vehicle for that power? Okay, so let's use me as an example. 
I have a fridge that I want to run. I've got a two meter ham radio that I want to run. I have a um, cellular booster that's in there. I want to have a couple outlets in the back of the vehicle uh, for charging USB stuff as well as um, maybe a 12 volt coffee maker rack there might be kind of cool. Um, I have lights in the hatch, maybe a couple lights up on the roof that I want to add on there. I've got some lights on the front, well, and uh, a winch on the front of the vehicle. You've got all of these different systems that you want to run. You've got to get electrical to all of those, those systems. Everybody's list of systems are going to be different, okay? One size does not fit all. Uh, some folks don't need the extra lighting on the outside of the vehicle. That's going to help as far as distribution. Uh, some folks want to have um, a, a lot of power in the, in the cab, up in the cockpit of the vehicle to have things going on. That has some different distribution requirements. Um, what I have found after building quite a few vehicles is that I end up putting less and less into those vehicles. I uncomplicate the systems make them as easy and functional as possible without a lot of added on things, what I would call solutions to problems that don't exist. Um, my, one of my first builds, I had a hot water, electrical hot water system built into the vehicles for showering. It cost me $1,500. It was a really cool system. I used it twice. Why? I had a 3000 watt inverter that I wanted to use. I used it for charging small items. Why do I need 3,000 3, watts of power in my vehicle? There are reasons. I just didn't have any of them. I built it way overkill. I had relay systems set up for monitoring all sorts of stuff. And I ended up just really not using a whole lot of it. And so what I found is that I, I simplify the system over time, keep it less complicated, and there's less things to go wrong. I use a simple fuse block under the hood. Uh, I run some electrical, uh, some larger electrical to a compressor that's under the hood. Um, I have uh, wires that I run through the, the firewall and run back for an outlet for the fridge and I put another little USB outlet next to the fridge outlet, piggybacked right off of that outlet. Uh, run a couple other little wires, whatever that system might be. I've narrowed it down to a little six, six fuse block uh, under the hood and that is plenty for for me but that's just me if you want to go into all sorts of systems there are the s pod systems there's smart switch there's there's a bunch of different options out there and they're all for the most part great uh great systems and if that's what you want to do if you want to be able to you know run a light show from your phone sitting in the campfire have at it man if that's your thing go for it but what you ought to think about is there's a lot of money, time, and effort put into that distribution systems, and some of those things can end up going wrong if you don't do them correctly. You want to make sure that you always have some type of safety uh, interplay between the battery and where your end location of uh, power is. Simply putting an inline fuse or through a fuse block is going to make sure that you don't burn your truck down because you did something silly or you've rattled the wire to where it's it's now in, in contact with the frame it's going to start a fire you don't want that make sure you're safe about it um, if distribution is really not your thing sometimes you can get away with something like we have with our portable systems here where you have two wires from the battery you connect it in here plug in here and all of your distribution is taken care of outlets for fridges outlets for usb con connections uh, outlets for cigarette lighter uh, style charge capacities, solar input, uh, distribution of higher amperage things like compressors or inverters that take a lot more power. You can run those all off of this system. If you have this in the back of your vehicle, now you don't have to run all those wires. You don't have to tear the interior of your car apart to run the wiring to make all this happen. You have it all in one place and it makes it very simple. Lots of questions to decide. You need to get out a big piece of graph paper and start making some boxes and what you're going to do about things. And if you have questions, well, we're always here to help out, but distribution is, is very key. One thing that I want to talk to you about distribution, it's very important, is your winch. I'm a devout believer that anything that you add to your vehicle 
electrically should be run external of your vehicle's electrical, current electrical system. Leave the OEM system alone. Don't mess with it. Today's vehicles are so interdependent upon connectivity and monitoring in their electrical systems for charging rates on the batteries to what's running and what's not and what's going on. You don't want to tap into any of that stuff and mess it up because then you're going down a rabbit hole that you'll never get out of. So by having an auxiliary battery system, you can take all of your external electrical solutions, hook them up to that auxiliary battery systems. It's a separate complete entity and it does its job correctly by itself without messing up the vehicle, okay? It also helps with your warranty. If you start crashing into electrical systems on your vehicle, you could void warranty uh, capabilities there too, not good. But the one thing is the winch. The winch, in my opinion, should always be hooked up to the main battery terminals. And here's the reason why. A winch is a energy monster. It devours power and a lot more power than what your battery can supply for a long time. So where that energy is coming from is your alternator. Nine times out of 10, your alternator is gonna be the one providing the power to the winch to make, the, to make that winch work properly in a recovery scenario. Your main battery ends up just being, in essence, a terminal block for the capacity of that alternator to manage that winch. Um, if you put your winch on your auxiliary battery systems, now you have a winch that's going to an auxiliary battery which is connected to a battery management system, which is connected to a main battery, which is connected to your alternator. You've now tripled the amount of, of electrical current re capacity requirement for what? I don't know what that answer would be. If you hook it right off the main battery terminals to your winch, awesome. That gives it a direct current right to the battery. What if your vehicle can't run and provide that solution? The management systems we have can connect your auxiliary battery to your main battery to, in essence, double or sometimes triple the amount of reserve capacity that your main battery has. It doesn't mean you have to run that electrical current through it to that winch, but you can supplement the main battery's electrical capacity through that main battery. Connect your winch to your main battery. It's the best solution for that. So distribution can be literally a spaghetti bowl in your vehicle. I've taken that whole interiors out of vehicles to run the wiring and electrical for, for systems before and in other ones I've run two wires to the back and called it good. It really depends on what you want to do. If you go with something portable you can run a distribution block or a fuse block and put it somewhere in your vehicle just right off of a plug on the front of this. Um, a fuse block doesn't have to be under the hood to be functional. There's a lot of opportunities with a portable system if under the hood just doesn't make any sense. The distribution is gonna be a key of that. And we have all sorts of odds and bits and doodads and monitors and, and outputs and all sorts of things that, that'll help you down that road if you wanna go down that road. But distribution is also a very key component in your decision set in your hierarchy uh, tree of, of decisions to be made here. So think that part, part of it through along with all these other things to, to make sure that what you're doing is correct and accurate for you. All right, if you've made it this far with me, congratulations. This has been a long discussion. We've talked about a lot of things in here. We've talked about all sorts of things between options and vehicles and goals and distribution and batteries and charging systems and alternative charging stuff and all of these decisions. And you get to, uh, a feeling that it's overwhelming to do this. It's really not. It's really a matter of making some simple decisions about what direction you want to go down through your hierarchy tree. You know, what are your goals? What vehicle? Choose a vehicle. What do you want in that vehicle? Inside, outside, we go that direction. What kind of charging? Well, what's my budget? I'm going to go AGM. I can go that way. And so you can work yourself down through a hierarchy tree of what those decisions are and come up with a plan. And if you've got a plan for what you're doing, 
then all the better. You get to choose in all of those decisions what is best for you. And you went about it logically with, with a path towards a goal and you'll have some solutions on the other end. And then you'll know what you're doing and what you want. And if you don't have the answers to some of those questions, well, that's why we're here. We'd love to help you out and happy to do so. We've got a lot of suggestions and ideas. Come to us with a problem, we'll do our best. Like I said, we'll do our best uh, to help you out in that situation. I hope all of this information has been helpful. And if you do have questions, reach out to us at equippedone.com. We're here to help. I appreciate your time. Thank you.